Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Two cabinet ministers have appeared to suggest today that the public sector pay cap of 1% should be reviewed. Labour are forcing a Commons vote tonight on the cap, which has been in place since 2013. They're calling on the government to abandon the limit in what will be the first parliamentary test for Theresa May, since she failed to win an outright majority at the general election. Here's our political editor, Laura Koonsberg. Her report contains flashing images. Governing feels a bit like a work in progress right now. Almost with each new day in this new era. Hence, more of the Tories' plans will simply disappear. Mr Gork, is it time to lift the pay cap? Excuse me, thanks very much. Thank you. Other ministers were willing to say, to hint, that the limit on public sector pay will disappear. Well, we've had to take some tough decisions. And in the wake of the general election, we're going to have to think through what we do come the next budget. This is obviously something we have to consider, not just uh, for the army, but right across the public sector as a whole. Nurses, teachers, most public sector workers in England, Wales and Northern Ireland have been limited to 1% pay rises for five years now. It was meant to save £5 billion by 2020 to help close the gap between what the government takes in from our taxes and its spends. Scrapping the cap was a big part of Labour's election campaign. Questions to the Prime Minister. But the first Prime Minister's questions since, nearly every Labour frontbencher had the message pinned to their chest. The public sector pay cap is hitting recruitment and retention right across the public sector. But one of the architects of the original plan thinks now it's time the protests were heard. We've seen the public sector uh, fall back into the position where many public sector workers are now paid less well than comparable people in the uh, uh, private sector. And, uh, therefore, in, gradually, you have to adapt to that reality by doing something about public sector pay. Using their newfound force to get rid of the cap would be a huge win for this gaggle of Labour with all its new MPs. The party's forcing a vote tonight to try to do just that. Despite ministers' public hints, by late afternoon, number 10 said that nothing had changed. One cabinet minister told me they just don't know what they're yet going to do. But carry on with the cap. The government looks deaf to concerns they have themselves acknowledged. Ditch it, though, and it costs the taxpayer billions. Or make no decision the alternative is confusion, perhaps for many more months. People up and down this country want an end to austerity. They want an end to public sector pay freezes. And it looked as though this morning the government was starting to move on this. That nothing has changed is really worrying and should send out uh, alarm bells to Conservative MPs that thought that they could change something. Numbers 10 and 11 say there's no difference in their positions despite suggestions the Treasury was less than impressed. But the problem of public sector pay for the main resident of this street added to the list. Laura Kunzberg, BBC News, Westminster. Well, tonight's vote comes amid signs that public attitudes, attitudes to pay and taxation are changing. The annual survey of public opinion shows that nearly half of us now want higher taxes to pay for more spending on health, education and social benefits. Here's our economics editor, Kamal Ahmed. It has been a clash of cultures. On the one side, anger at public sector cuts. Because of our plan, things are getting better. But there is still a long way to go. On the other, a government, past and present, which says we must fix the public finances. I've come to Ealing in West London. Now, before the election, this was a marginal seat, with the Conservatives just a few hundred votes behind Labour. Now, it is safe Labour. Thousands turned out for the local candidate. Does that mean that voters want more taxes or want more public spending? I'm here to find out. 
I earn in the top tax bracket. Do you think you should be paying more tax? I think I should be paying more tax, absolutely. I would pay more tax so that I don't have children myself, but so that I know that children are going to better schools. Yeah, would I want to pay more taxes? No, I think I'd rather see this, the taxes that we are paying spent more efficiently. Um, I already pay enough tax. <laughs> This is the big tax and spending debate, and attitudes are certainly changing. In 2010, 32% of people questioned supported increasing taxes and spending more. That figure has risen to 48%. At the same time, those who support keeping tax and spending at the same level has fallen from 56% to 44%. That significant shift comes as austerity has bitten. Government spending as a share of our overall economic wealth has declined. And taxes have also increased. The question now, could they go higher? If you want something that's a game changer, that's something that's going to result in you having tens of billions of pounds of additional revenue to spend, then you can't just do that from the rich or indeed just from companies. You have to have a much broader based increase in tax, as we see actually in many other competitor countries which have higher levels of spending, and higher levels of tax. Today, a hint. The public sector pay cap could be reviewed, but every 1% pay increase could cost £2 billion. Increasing spending might be popular, but take care. In principle, if you increase spending, you will increase growth, at least in the short time, but it is very important to think about what that spending is going on because that will influence the longer term growth prospects of the economy. Plenty of people might want a change of direction, but the big question to answer, who is going to pay for it? Kamal Ahmed, BBC News. Now the Grenfell Tower disaster dominated the first Prime Minister's questions since the election today, but it was the noises coming from Downing Street that were making the headlines as a government source briefed journalists that a reversal of the public sector pay freeze could be on the cards, a briefing that was dismissed barely three hours later. Our political correspondent, Michael Crick, joins me now from Westminster. Michael. Well, John, the, uh, the first big vote of this parliament has just been held tonight. The government won it by 14 votes, by 323 to 309. About what you'd expect, given the new deal that they've uh, just forged with the, uh, the DUP. Now, one of the big issues uh, at, uh, in that vote, the, put in the Labour amendment, was the whole question of the uh, pay cap on public sector pay instituted by George Osborne due to carry on until 2019. Now, there have been a string of noises today from government ministers from in, within government suggesting that that pay cap is about to be relaxed. Tonight, the government have denied it. They've said that the policy hasn't changed. But it's clear there's considerable disarray within government and also clear that the mood here with, among MPs has changed considerably to the extent that it's now difficult to see the public sector pay cap continuing in its current form beyond the Chancellor's budget this autumn. Firefighters who tackled the Grenfell Tower disaster, police who've coped with successive terrorist attacks, nurses in a strained health service, and members of the armed forces. They and many other state employees may find the 1% pay cap they've endured since 2013 is soon eased. The Defence Secretary certainly suggested that when asked about pay in his field this morning. That is uh, obviously a huge question. It's partly um, a matter for the pay review bodies, um, but it is also, you know, involves a forecast of where you expect inflation to be. Um, you know, I think we expect inflation to start falling back again uh, from the autumn onwards, but it is obviously something we have to consider not just uh, for the army, but right across the public sector as a whole. Theresa May the then faced her first question time since the election, dominated by Grenfell Tower, of course. When you cut local authority budgets by 40%, we all pay a price in public safety. And Labour linked the fire much more forcefully than before, with spending cuts by Tory governments. I urge the Prime Minister to come up with the resources needed to test and remove cladding, retrofit sprinklers, properly fund the fire service and the police so that all our communities can truly feel safe 
in their own homes. Mr Speaker, this disaster must be a wake-up call. The cladding of tower blocks began under the Blair government. The PM was giving as good as she got. We should come together and ensure that we... We get to the answers of why this has happened over many years, what has gone wrong, and how do we stop it from happening in the future. And just as Labour launched its offensive against austerity in the Commons chamber, behind the scenes, a government spokesman gave an even stronger hint that once the pay review bodies report in the next few weeks, then the 1% pay cap may well be eased. We heard at the election, he said, how people are weary after years of hard work to repair the economy. And that's echoed by many backbench Tories right now, including this former cabinet minister who came within 315 votes of losing his seat. My majority did go down and I remember the one conversation on the doorstep day before polling day of a nurse telling me that she liked me, she respected what I did for the constituency, but she couldn't vote for me because of this issue of nurses' pay. So yes, it's something that I, I felt very personally in my own constituency, but I think if you talk to MPs right across the House of Commons, this is a theme that's come up a lot in recent weeks in all parts of the UK. But tonight, the government tried to row back. Nothing's changed, they said. But the mood certainly has changed since June the 8th and the vote may no longer be there to hold the pay cap much longer. Well, now, the government hints of pay rises for public sector workers come amid growing unease among Conservative MPs worried about the living standards of their constituents after years of austerity. Jeremy Corbyn reflected that shift in the public mood, reflecting concerns after the horror of the Grenfell fire. The latest British Social Attitude survey finds, for the first time since the financial crash, that more people think taxes should go up to allow more spending than those who think tax and spending levels should stay the same. But has past government spending helped tackle inequality? The latest report from the Social Mobility Commission says that despite 20 years of effort, actually the nation has become ever more divided. Aspirational youngsters in many urban and rural communities, not just in the north, are having to move out to get on leaving left-behind communities socially hollowed out. In 1998, the highest earners were paid, on average, 47 times as much as the lowest. By 2015, the equivalent gap had risen to 128 times more. And for young people, the increasing unaffordability of housing and suppressed wages has increased a generational divide. I was certainly brought up to believe that if you put an effort you got reward and the problem today is that people are putting an effort but the rewards aren't forthcoming at least not for the majority of people in society now the conclusions of his report are stark for example it finds that at the current rate of improvement it will be 120 years before disadvantaged young people achieve the same a levels as their better off peers none of these things are god given they're a consequence of the choices and the decisions that we as a society and the politicians that represent us take. So, the big question, is there the political will to take on the problem of inequality? I'm joined now by freelance journalist Poppy Noor, who went from living in homeless shelters to graduating from Cambridge. Also here is the director of the think tank class, Faiza Shaheen, and from the Adam Smith Institute, Matt Kincoin. Now, now Faiza, this is a massive challenge both these reports spell out the scale of it there's no quick fix no but i think what the reports show us is that we've been doing the same thing again and again and we haven't seen the results there's a very simple rule when it comes to social mobility and that is when there's huge levels higher levels of income and wealth disparities the rungs of the ladder are simply wider apart it's harder to climb so more equal societies you see higher levels of social mobility that's ge the general rule there's a, a, a few vague uh, uh, exceptions but generally that's the rule and what we've done is that we haven't focused on income and wealth inequalities in fact we've seen wealth inequality rise in particular rise massively over the last 10 years we, those in the top 100 of the top thousand have seen their wealth double in fact so you know we can talk about social mobility but really we're not 
doing anything about the underlying causes. And in fact, in the last seven years, austerity, which has cut school budgets, you know, public services, sure start, has really contradicted any kind of rhetoric or, or you know, even genuine commitment to do something about social mobility. It's just the policy hasn't been there to back up what we need to see to address social mobility. So, Matt, I mean, from the other side of the spectrum, what's the solution? So some of the solutions have got to come from radical policy changes, the radical centre. You're absolutely right that there have been certain policies that have been pursued, such as comprehensive education in the United Kingdom, which for 20 years prior to 2010 was the, seen as the panacea of education. After 2010, we saw a radical change in education policy in the United Kingdom, uh, freeing up of the curriculum in academies and in free schools as well. And one of the fi central findings of the social mobility report yesterday was that we finally started to see a narrowing of, uh, of attainment gap between the poorest uh, children in our society and the richest. But we're also told in the same report that it's going to be 120 years before the poorest sector are able to achieve the A-level results if it, if the it continues, I mean, it was a survey that was taken over 20 years, mm. so if we, if we took it at just the, the face value, you're absolutely right. But, unfortunately, we should take it at the changes that are happening now, and we think that that will accelerate out as the, as the changes mm. are fed into society. Instead of having that centralised model, we're going to well, see an acceleration uh, uh, of... Poppy, to hear, yeah, here, Matt, make a we've got a, a, a revolution in education <laughs> going on. I mean... I, I, the, I guess the thing is, is, is looking at my own example, um, you're talking about a narrowing of the gap for the first time. Um, at the moment in this country, it doesn't make a difference whether you go to the best university in the world. You can end up working for jobs because at the end of the day, if you don't deal with the structural issues that maintain inequality, it persists. So I went to the best university in the world, but the fact that my parents are poor means that I can't live at home with them. It means that I therefore spend more than half of my income on rent and it means that I can never save and it means that I have to have four jobs in order to maintain myself so actually you know this it's it at, at the way that things are without dealing with structural inequalities it doesn't make a difference Matt. I want to sort of understand a bit more about what the, the kind of radical changes that you want to see because I also don't it's live at home. It's not that radical, actually. I mean, essentially what it's about is to do something about housing, to do something to make sure that it's... I mean, it's so unaffordable right now. I absolutely right agree now, with right? you. Lots you know what? Housing, housing is, a, is an utter shambles in this country. I mean, there are certain, child, there are certain care, fantastic what you things do that we in can education. do about that. This but is normal policy you're in just a lot listing, of other You're countries. just listing problems. I want to come up with solutions. In housing, we can, change, we can build on the green belt. We can, change, we can allow councils to grant planning permission to themselves and sell it onto the market. And then they will allow you know, investment into public areas and public services, whilst also allowing those houses to be built for young people, not just in London, but across the United States. Yeah, but, but you can build as many houses as you like, uh, and that would be a great thing to do. But the fact of the matter is austerity has really gripped people at the lower end of the society by the throat. So there are two things from this. I mean, actually, that's, that's, there, are, there are facts and figures about austerity that suggest that, A, it's been a positive for the UK economy. We've seen the best level of growth from between 2010 and 2016 of the G7, whilst also, whilst also wage growth at the lowest of the poorest, whilst also taking them out of tax altogether. That in many ways, it's a victim of its own success in terms of... In I mean, you need... There, there is a real question, and governments and politicians and different people like to talk about growth, and we have to think about what is growth there for. And if it's just a figure which is artificially inflated by growth at the top, and it means that it's not being spread out by equally, and it means that you can work really, really hard, as you're talking about, and and it makes no difference to your life chances whatsoever, then what's the point in growth? But it absolutely is. We, we now have record levels of employment. 2.9 million but people when they told us... When they told us it? that... There were, there were it's people, employment there were like people. mine. I have four jobs. I wonder how, I wonder how many times that's being counted. The, Does it mean that I'm living a, a decent standard of life? Does it mean that my life, you know, work and, and all of that has paid off? There are, there are people who, in this country, sorry, who, who obviously work four jobs and who have enormous amounts of life challenges towards them. But that doesn't delegitimize de the program of austerity. In many, we've so, now, so you we would argue have, austerity, uh, austerity really needs to stay on? That the, the second briefing today is right, the earlier briefing is wrong? Earlier in the, uh, earlier in the decade, when we, we were in the biggest crisis, financial crisis, since the Great, Recession, since the Great Depression in 1929, people said, don't fix the roof whilst the winds are blowing, whilst the winds are howling. Now it's the, we've got to the point where there is growth, where there is wage growth, when there is, when there is rising employment. 
and people are still telling us not to fix the roof whilst not the sun yeah. is shining. Yeah. There I mean, there's, is, there there's is, a couple of there things here in terms that. of the evidence. So there's a disconnect between what you're saying and what people feel in their own lives. We've heard from Poppy there, but we know that people are getting letters home from their head teachers. What, is that just made up? You know, saying that, like, your, your schools are being underfunded and people are worried about that. It's gone too far. When we hear nurses going to food banks, like, that real-life experience, you can't just sweep away. And the other thing is on austerity. In a pure economic argument, actually, it's failed. It's failed because the best way to pay down public debt is to create well-paying jobs, increase the tax take. And actually, absolutely instead, is. what it we've is, seen is, is more zero-hour... Zero you're absolutely right. Contracts. Let's raise growth. But the way we raise growth isn't by artificially producing wage growth, isn't by inflation, isn't by the measures produced by the Labour Party, it's by decreasing the but amount what, of burden of tax on businesses. Right now, one, of, one of the measures that the Labour Party came up with for this election was by increasing corporation mm. tax. We know who pays the corporation tax. It's employees, it's, it's consumers in higher prices and in their jobs. Well, we, we certainly haven't resolved the problem here, but we've certainly aired it. Uh, thank you very much. Not indeed. everyone hates the Tories as much as you do. Not, not, uh, you can say that, but that is actually a, a, a very unpleasant thing to have done. Uh, thank you very much, Matt uh, Kilcoyne. Nice of you to come in. And thank you very much indeed, Poppy Noor. And thank you very much... Uh, Pfizer Shaheen. The government won an important vote in the Commons tonight, defeating a Labour amendment to the Queen's speech. It should also win the final vote on that Queen's speech tomorrow. So it will then have shown it can survive. But thrive, not so clear. In the last 24 hours or so, we've seen raggedness of thought and ill discipline of purpose. We thought the goals for this government were to deliver Brexit and reduce the deficit. But unity on both those looks to be disintegrating. Chancellor Philip Hammond made a thinly veiled joke at the expense of Boris Johnson last night and appeared at odds with David Davis over transitional Brexit arrangement. And more confusion today on austerity. There were hints that the public sector pay cap, the 1% rise cap, would be dropped. And then those hints were played down later on. When a teacher loses control of a class, it's hard to get it back. Is that where Mrs May finds herself at the dawn? Uh, of this parliament. Well, Nick Watt, our political editor, is with me. Um, Nick, first of all, this public sector pay stuff, because the morning story was one thing, then it changed this afternoon. What was going on behind the scenes? Well, it's welcome to our new world of a minority government and a newly assertive Chancellor of the Exchequer. So we can now watch cabinet rows in full technicolour. <laughs> so earlier today, we had three cabinet ministers, Michael Fallon, Jeremy Hunt and Chris Grayling, all saying that the government is listening to the electorate and the time has perhaps come to take a look at the public sector, 1% public sector pay cap that was imposed in 2012. Downing Street backed them until Philip Hammond insisted there was no change. The pay cap would last until 2020. And I understand that Philip Hammond is saying to colleagues, if there is a fiscal announcement, that's my job. And a £4.1 billion commitment to increase public sector pay in line with inflation, well, that would need a funding stream. Now, these three cabinet ministers do not have a history of freelancing. And I understand they are saying back to the Chancellor, we thought you, we were echoing your comments when you said a few weeks ago you were not deaf to concerns about austerity. Right, OK, well, that's one argument. I mean, where does this leave the government? Or more specifically, we're right at the beginning of this parliament, where does it leave... Theresa May and her government. Well, as you were saying in your introduction, we've now had senior ministers at odds on two consecutive days on two of the defining issues of this government, fiscal policy and Brexit. And I think uh, the diplomatic way of looking at this is, as one Westminster figure said to me, that this is reflective of a government finding its way. Um, but there is a deeper point here. Can a wounded Prime Minister assert her authority over Cabinet, or will she sort of be buffeted around as her weakness means that traditional Cabinet squabbles really sort of play out in the open? Now, Downing Street hopes that its likely success in the main Queen's speech vote tomorrow will put this government and Theresa May on a firmer footing. So I've been looking to see whether that number 10 calculation really will play out. Enfeebled by her surprise electoral setback, the Prime Minister has lost that most precious political weapon, control of timing. In the three weeks since polling day, Theresa May has watched as a mere spectator while the clock has ticked down on her premiership. The likely passage of the Queen's speech tomorrow 
will give Theresa May her first opportunity since the election to assume some control over the date of her exit. Allies have told Newsnight that having secured the Tory grip on number 10, the Prime Minister will seek to remain in Downing Street for at least two years, the duration of the Brexit talks. But one former cabinet minister believes Theresa May should stand down by the time of the next election, if not before. It is widely accepted, as I say, across the Conservative Party that we need to have a new leader in place by the time that the Conservative Party you know, goes into the next election. A leading Brexit supporter believes Theresa May could yet confound her critics. Being Prime Minister in tenancy terms is an assured shorthold rather than a 1977 tenancy act. Um, that some Prime Ministers who look incredibly strong and who will go on forever are gone quite quickly. So if you take David Cameron in August uh, 2015, you thought he could be there for years, and he's gone within 12 months. If you take Margaret Thatcher in 1981, everyone's conspiring to get rid of her, and then the Falkland comes along and she's in for nearly another 10 years. So with Mrs May, it's very hard to tell, but she could be there longer than people are currently speculating, uh, that with the DUP, there's the basis of a parliamentary majority, Tory MPs don't want an election, the DUP doesn't want an election, a lot of backbench Labour MPs don't much want an election either. In private, Cabinet Ministers agree with the Prime Minister that she has the right to see the Brexit talk through, though they wonder whether she has the stomach for a relentless fight in Parliament. Other Tories say that the successful passage of the Queen's speech will allow them to ask difficult questions about her future as Prime Minister. They say that the length of her tenure in Downing Street will depend on the answers to three questions. In the first place, does she have the authority to see the Brexit negotiations through? Secondly, is there a credible alternative? And the final question is, can she rise again like a phoenix? Nicky Morgan believes the Brexit timetable points to a natural handover of power around the autumn of next year. Once that shape of Brexit is concluded, once those, those deals are very much on the table, the Conservative Party must not miss the opportunity at that stage to think about who we want to be our future leader. Because that's interesting, because essentially the, the, the position is, the Barnier position is that the deal should be on the table by basically October 2018, so you can allow for that ratification. So it could well be around about that stage, towards the end of 2018, the Conservative Party needs to think about who its leader should be. I think that's, that's, probably, that's probably right. That's certainly one uh, timetable. Um, of course, I think one of the things that the last couple of years has shown is that making predictions about British politics or international politics is incredibly uh, difficult at the, at the moment. Uh, but I think the point is that the Conservative Party, having started on the, the Brexit road, really is going to own the negotiations, is going to own the shape of uh, Brexit, and that's clearly going to be something uh, that uh, will... Um, if not be the issue of the next election, will be something that will be standing on that record in terms of the party going into the next election. One Tory who was a surprise loser in the election thinks Theresa May will need to change her ways to survive. We will need a leader who can articulate a vision about where Britain is um, and where it needs to be uh, in the next, say, 10 years. That's the, the, the task. And I think Theresa um, is an excellent uh, operator in many, many ways, but uh, she has got to change her style in terms of uh, setting out an agenda, talking about a vision and connecting with people. And if she doesn't do that, I think there may well have to be a change. One Tory grandee told me simply, Theresa May is finished as Prime Minister. She has no authority to conduct the Brexit negotiations and she should announce immediately after the passage of the Queen's speech tomorrow night that she is allowing for an orderly transition to a successor. But one cabinet minister who is aware of the Prime Minister's flaws says that she is slowly building up her credibility around the cabinet table and in Parliament. Theresa May is helped by strong backing from Brexiteers. One leading figure insists he supports her on merit. Very often, our strengths and our weaknesses are the same, two sides of the same coin. That Theresa May is strong and stable, or she's a, a rude word, difficult woman. And if you're looking at her strength, she's strong and stable. If you're an opponent, she's expletive, deleted, difficult woman. And that is exactly the same personality type. 
And what we need at the moment is somebody who is resolute and carries on, has an element of stubbornness within her. That seems to me to be the leader that we've got. Jacob Rees-Mogg believes the talk of an early leadership contest is far-fetched. I think it's Folderol. I don't think anything is actually happening. None of these figures has tapped me on the shoulder, nor have their agents, and said, why don't you back so-and-so, um, Snodgrass Minor, for the leadership. A beneficiary of the troubled Tory campaign offers some advice for the Prime Minister. She won't last as Prime Minister if she cannot build agreement across the House for a sane Brexit. She won't, because people are very clear from what they heard from their constituents that a change in approach is needed. And, you know, she really does need to understand what happened during the election, drop those slogans, focus on a sane Brexit and build across party divides. By tomorrow night, Theresa May will have consolidated her hold over Downing Street, giving her greater control over the timing of her next moves. But a sense that the countdown to her own exit has slowed may ironically embolden Tory critics to speak out. Nick, what there? Well, I'm joined now by Conservative MP David Jones, who was until very recently the Minister of State for exiting the EU. Very good evening to you. Good How evening. long do you give, Theresa May? Well, I think we have to acknowledge that it was a difficult election campaign. We, we didn't do as well as we wanted to. But I think that most uh, members of Parliament were very impressed by what she did immediately afterwards. She came to the 1922 committee. She acknowledged that there had been mistakes. She, she put her hands up to it. And she got a great deal of support from everybody who was present in that room. Uh, and I think that, slowly but surely, she's building up her credibility with the party, and I think that she's got quite a long time ahead it's of her. It's interesting you say she's building up her credibility, because today, first vote in the Parliament, um, so it was a vote on a Labour amendment to get rid of the public sector 1% pay cap. You stuck with the vote, you voted against the Labour amendment. The morning briefings were you were going to get rid of the cap despite voting against the Labour amendment. This afternoon, you had retreated on the, 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 the change on policy. It was like complete confusion. Can the next 1,722 days of this Parliament carry on like that? Well, I, I have to acknowledge that today was not one of the best days. But, but nevertheless, l looking at what's happened over the last two weeks, I, I've seen Theresa May stabilising the ship, uh, and I think that what, she but, can... What, sorry, what... what Stabilising the ship? Since the election, which was a disaster, Grenfell, she's had to apologise to the nation for the reaction to that, and she's... We've had today this vote on a complete confusion over policy. Well, it's been a very difficult time. I, I, I don't deny but, that. But you said she's building up her credibility rather than burning yeah, through well, her well, credibility. Yes, I do, because quite frankly, at the end of the election campaign, that credibility was very low. In fact, the entire right. party's credibility was very low. But nevertheless, I don't detect any appetite within the parliamentary party to see her go. Would you describe your old department, the, the Dex EU, your, the, the department you were dropped from, would you describe that as chaos? No, I wouldn't. I would actually say that DEXU uh, is an extremely effective department. I think that it's got an extremely strong team of officials, and I think they're very well prepared for the negotiations. But you were dropped and another one resigned about five days before the negotiations started. That's, that's madness. Well, isn't it? I, I'm not second guessing why the Prime Minister decided to. <laughs> well, why do you with, think she with, dropped I, you? Why did she I, drop I, you? I, I just said I'm not second guessing why the Prime Minister decided to dispense with my services. Any politician who takes a ministerial role knows that from the moment he's appointed, he's that much closer but, to leaving. Hang on, we, we basically, five days before the negotiations started, we, we lost two of the people in the departments who were going to be doing the negotiating. We, was, we had to bring in two new people who had five days' notice to get ready to meet Monsieur, Monsieur Bayer. And, and two very competent people who I think will do an extremely good job, but most importantly, backed up by an extremely strong team of officials and led by uh, the very competent David Davis. It's all going so well on your account. Do you think David Davis and Philip Hammond can both stay in post for the next two years? And... and, and, and and, and, and agree something between them. Yes, I do. And in fact, quite contrary to the reports in today's newspapers, they actually work very closely indeed. They have uh, regular meetings and discussions. Uh, I think that today's reports have been overblown. Uh, overblown. I think that it's essentially a, a, a difference of emphasis, but I think that actually they're working extremely closely and very effectively together. What's the difference of emphasis, do you think, between them? Well, I mean, the, the, this morning, for example, there was the suggestion that uh, Philip Hammond wanted us to remain in the customs union. David Davis 
is saying not, but in fact... Well, that's not, that's but, not an emphasis. Well, 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 it is, because in fact both David Davis and Philip Hammond are agreed that we will have to be out of the, both the customs union and the single market by the end of this parliament in five years' time. But what's interesting is, because even though, even though you were dropped from the government, you're, you're, you're behaving, if I may say, and this is not being, being rude, you're behaving in a very loyal way. You clearly think Theresa May should stick it out for, for, for quite a while. You're basically with the party on all of this. In a way, it seems like the leadership issue has become a proxy for the Brexit issue. It was interesting listening to Nicky Morgan thinking, well, the clock's ticking on Theresa May, and Jacob Rees-Mogg in that piece saying, no, she's the right person to steer us through. Is this the case now? Brexiteers are putting their faith in Theresa May. Soft Brexiteers or Remainers are saying, Maybe we need to get rid of her and we can get something moving on I, Brexit. I, look, I think there's no doubt that Brexit is going to be the defining issue of this Parliament. And, of course, we've only got a very limited timetable to work through. We've got one year and nine months. And so, really, what we can't afford is the indulgence of talking about alternative leaders, of putting in place somebody else, for someone who actually, I think, will, will do a very good job and will lead the country through these right. negotiations very effectively. But you're making my point. The Brexiteers are key, have, clearly have more faith in Theresa May than... Than anyone else but you say you know this is no time for indulgence it is surely a time for people to discuss and, and, and express their concern over the Theresa May plan for Brexit which clearly didn't grab the population in, in, in the election. Well, I, I don't think it was that I think frankly that the the big issues were other non-Brexit related issues I think most, most particularly the issue of social care uh, but also one or two other issues too uh, but I think so far as Brexit is concerned we, we're now in the position where 80 percent of the uh, electorate of this country voted for parties who want to I take Britain out of the EU. Sorry, what? What planet are you on? Loads of swing voters who might have voted Tory voted for Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party because they so detested the Theresa May version of Brexit. Metropolitan Liberal I, Remainers I, I don't see how said we can, cannot vote for Theresa May because we don't like her I Brexit. don't see how you can possibly read that into the election result. Well, the polls show, and I know we don't put a huge amount of weight on polls, but the polls show more people didn't like her version of Brexit than did like her version of Brexit. You can't <laughs> say that everyone who voted Labour was endorsing Theresa May Brexit because they voted for a party. Look, Brexit, Brexit actually, to coin a phrase, does mean Brexit. We have already set ourselves on the course for lead, lead, leaving the European but Union. But hang on, you were saying if someone voted Labour, they were effectively endorsing Theresa May's they Brexit. Were, that they, is completely no, untrue, what, what, isn't they, it? They, they, they voted Labour as a protest against Theresa May's Brexit. Well, I don't see how you can possibly read that into it Because they, they thought they'd get, they thought they'd get uh, a softer Brexit from Labour I, I, and I, potentially I, stay in the customs union because they thought it was bonkers to leave it. I, 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 I think that that is a complete misreading of the election. So you, do you accept so. the polls that show more people believe that the, the Theresa May's Brexit should be amended than supported? Look, Theresa May's Brexit is absolutely clear, and that is to leave the European Union, but to seek the best possible relationship with the European Union right. in terms of a free trade agreement uh, and in terms, of course, of access to the single market. Why not have a free vote on it? All those MPs have been honest about their views on the situation in the election. We've just had an election. We've They've actually all been had voted the vote already. Post-referendum. Well, then let the MPs well, vote on which Brexit they well, want. Well, uh, forgive me, but we've already agreed and decided to leave the U European Union. And there are multiple we've ways we've of leaving the European Union. It doesn't have to be the way you want to do it. The ways of leaving the European Union are specified in Article 50, and that's the process that we're going through at the moment. Are you saying, sorry, this is really important, are you saying there is literally only one way of leaving the European Union? There are no choices whatsoever in that at all? The choice has already been made. We've served the notice no, exactly. under Article 50, yes. and we are therefore on, a, on our way out of the European Union. What we're now doing is attempting to seek the best possible relationship with the European Union Union uh, after we have left and I think that that is something that is shared by part by members of parties on both sides of the house David Jones thank you very much thank you Stig and Carol are here and you want to start with the 1% pay cap for public services which all got a bit confusing today mm. well the government are, are in a mess over this even by their own standards of the mess they've had over the last <laughs> three weeks so we were told the ministers and, and representatives of the government were pushed out onto the radio and the television this morning to say they've been listening to the reaction of the electorate. They quite recognise that people in this country value nurses and policemen and firefighters, especially bearing in the month, the month that we've all had. Uh, and therefore, it's likely that this, this freeze on their, cap, on their pay, this 1% increase, is going to go. And it's going to go the next time they do a budget in the autumn. That was, that was pretty much the impression we're all meant to give. 
And then by three o'clock this afternoon, they were rowing back from that position. Meanwhile, Labour see an opportunity to make political hay of this by proposing an amendment uh, today uh, and make, having a vote on it, which the government won by whipping through both the Tories and the DUP. First test, obviously. First test, the and they passed it. And so by, in parliamentary terms, it was a successful day for Theresa May. She survived PMQs. She won a vote. So made her look stupid and hard. And, hard and, and, and then if you look at the vote, it's really important. If you want to watch the video of this, they win this vote by, thir by, by 14, a vote not to pay people more who everybody values and everybody accepts doesn't get paid enough money. But the, the government was never going to make policy on the back of a Labour amendment. I understand. Between speech, I, I understand. They're going to do it is, some budget. Which is why it's clever politics by Labour. It because, was very clever by because, Labour. And what happens is the Tories win the, the vote and they stand there and they parp and bray and they, they celebrate the parliamentary win mm. at a time when they should be looking at their shoes and saying, you know what we've all done? Mm. We've collectively voted to say to that nurse who's on the 13th hour of their shift, she's not entitled to pay, get any more money. And, and that is going to stick in the crawls of the, lots of the people. The frightening thing is, I think, though, if, if this is going to be part of the budget where they're, they're going to remove this cap, what is also going to happen in that budget is the taxes are going to rise and as soon as taxes rise people people have just less money in their pay packets so all the people who might get the cap lifted uh, they're, they're going to lose whatever they gain in in a budget in any in any income tax rise and that's what's going to happen and uh, but I, but I I do think this is just typical of the way the Tories are handling um, themselves at the moment since the election. They, they just don't seem to be able to take the right step anywhere. This should have been their move today. This should, I mean, and it looked like it was going to be. Why? This is a Queen's speech, speech debate. This well, isn't in the Queen's speech. Well, no, because, but, they, but they knew what... But there was all the talk this morning. Let me... All, Grayling was, was briefing this morning. So, the stop, was so, briefing. so the, fate, the, the mistake was to brief, was it? But the, well, the thing... Well, well, the, 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 cab the, the Cabinet is split over this. There's a massive split in the Cabinet over this. They're fighting over Which it. Which takes us to the top of the Times. Yes. saying that Hammond is uh, under pressure to relax public sector pay squeeze. Because, I mean, I mean, uh, what the, I mean, the Tories are grappling with a new electoral reality, and, and I think this is really abundantly clear. We are seeing a shift leftwards <coughs> from the British electorate. We're seeing young and middle-aged people who value the schooling for their kids. They value more than ever the NHS. They are willing to see money being spent on it. So austerity, that incredibly well-packaged system where we said to virtually everyone in the country, you'll have to do go with less, this is good for you, eat your vegetables, this is good for you. They packaged it brilliantly and they rammed it down uh, people's throats for five years and people swallowed it. They are not going to swallow it anymore it, and they're going to have to move away. But this, is a, this is going to be a problem for any government from now on because we have put people through austerity for seven years. We've all been through it. And when the argument was we had to get the deficit down and we had to get the debt down. Now, the deficit has been taken down by three quarters now. It used to be 9.9% .9 of the GDP seven years ago. It's now 2.2%. So, that, so that's good, I suppose. And the debt is still 1.68 trillion. However, how can we now abandon austerity Austerity and justify what people have been through for the for the last seven years. We have said for years we cannot leave our children with all this debt. We can't we can't keep spending in the way we were criticising Corbyn's policies. We were saying they would involve spend, 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 and, and the country would be bankrupt. How can we then chuck all of that out and then say the Tories are justified in spending? Well, and it, quite know and it looks like the though. Tories are going to do that because yeah, what they're going to say they they're going to say is people do not care as much about the debt mm. as they did once before. They recognise you can but borrow money at low rates of interest now. They want to see that money spent on public services. They want to see that money spent in areas that they value, like schooling, like uh, hospitals, like police, like firemen. That's the political reality. And the what Tories are going to be pushed leftwards whether they like it or not. But the not, reality is that Carney also came out today and was warning about you know, what, what might happen. And he said people are, people are borrowing their salaries in loans for cars. They're, bor they're borrowing on credit cards what their annual salary is. And he's saying we've got to stop that because if something happens again like it did in 2008, the country is done for. Mm. So it, it, it's, it's a risky policy whether they keep austerity or whether they don't. It's difficult to but they know. Seem, but they seem to have conceded the point on it, haven't they? I mean, they seem, I mean like, like you said, that's what this is such a mess. I mean, either they're going to produce a version of Toryism, conservatism, which fits this new 
electoral mood, an electoral how desire. Can, how can they do that and justify the last seven years of austerity? Well, that's how why the, that's it? the cleft stick they're in, and, the, and the, this is why this is actually a year ago we were talking about the existential threat to the Labour Party, which they've managed to sort out behind Jeremy Corbyn. We seem to have flipped the script now, and there is an existential crisis on what sort of Conservative Party can carry the country with it. You know, it is not just 18 to 24 year olds who were taken by Corbyn. It's people who are 30 to 44. They were the people who mobilised for Corbyn because what they looked at is they looked at the schools for their kids, they looked at the hospitals, they looked at the police services, and they looked at the Tories yeah, but, and said, but, but, "You no, have taken money out of the services." Some of Corbyn's ideas and policies were stupid. You know, the, the banning of the, of the student debt was ridiculous. That was going to cost 12 billion pounds, and he was also promising to refund some of that debt as well, which, whoever, depending on who you talk to, was between 20 and 30 billion. So, I mean, that was a stupid promise to make. But it, but it's it's just interesting today. Ministers are, are were talking about the, the tax rises that we're going to see in the budget, and they're saying that you know the rich will bear the brunt of that. Well, the rich already do actually. That one percent, I think, is, is it one percent of um, the, the country's the highest paid people pay 30 percent of taxes. That's right. However, and so it, it's unlikely they'll be hit with much more. But w the people who will be hit are working people. They're going to be hit big time.